Greetings from a wind-battered Fairfield campus, once again in the bowels of Lunder Library. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well and that you've survived the storm. It's been pretty rugged out there, and but it looks like it's coming to an end. I realize that some of you might not see this for a couple of days due to uh, pretty wide, widely ranging power outages and, and certainly probably some uh, internet outages too. So I understand and I can work with you accordingly on that. Uh, what I wanted to do was just share with you a little bit about what we're up to, uh, where we're headed and, and what the rest of the semester kind of looks like. So uh, as you probably know, I've provided feedback to everybody who submitted a complete um, blog assignment and I was generally very impressed with those. And again, remember the purpose of this is, is that we're trying to make science accessible and and that's really the most important thing to me and, and it really doesn't matter what you're doing, what role you're in um, and, or where you go to work. Um, if you work and engage in science you are going to have to share this with non-experts um, and so you'll see that in the uh, week number nine folder I added a link uh, from the University of Maine's uh, news blog and it, it happens to be about my sister-in-law's research and she works with zebrafish and so she does a lot of interesting experience with zebrafish, mostly because they're, I think, something about their, you know, uh, musculoskeletal system is a good uh, sort of proxy for the human system, and they're obviously easy to reproduce and things like that. But anyway, she does a lot of research, and in particular, she looks at muscu muscular dystrophy. And uh, recently, uh, she did this really interesting experiment where she injected the flu virus into these fish and watched uh, what happened. And she's the first person to try to do this. And what she basically found was that the fish who had muscular dystrophy or who had that gene or, or that trait uh, were really, really uh, affected negatively by the flu virus. So anyway, this is pretty esoteric research, um, but it's important research. Uh, and one of the things that she routinely has to do, whether she's communicating with the folks at the March of Dimes or she's communicating with a, a funding agency or she's communicating with the administrators at the University of Maine or she's just trying to you know, generally help the, the public, um, she has to be able to communicate this in a way that makes sense and so she could have gone completely off the deep end talking about the genetics and what she did and her methodologies and what it means and the statistics and the impact factor and all these types of things um, but at the end of the day what she really wanted to do was just communicate that this could be a really important uh, piece of information for folks who are suf suffering from uh, muscular dystrophy. So you may want to read that, it's just it's an interesting way, um, it's an interesting example I guess of how you can make very technical, very esoteric research very accessible accessible and meaningful to an audience and to me that's the most important thing is that there's a couple of, of really important tasks that a science writer has to do. One, we have to uh, show the significance and I, and I found myself saying this to a lot of you in your drafts, make sure the reader appreciates the significance of what you're saying. In other words, how does this make their life better? Or in some cases, how does it make their life worse? Or what does this mean on the ground? What should we be doing to prevent this, to uh, help with this, to mitigate these effects? So what, what should we do? Um, you know, the general public is very action oriented. We want to know what we're supposed to do and why we're supposed to do it. So that's one really important thing is just focus on significance. The other thing that's really important um, is to uh, focus on language and to make sure that you're using language that is very accessible to your reader. And I can't stress that enough. We want to use plain, simple language uh, whenever we can. And that is a, a trait of good science writing uh, across the board. So those are a few things. And then one more thing I guess that's worth noting is that you should just be anticipating the likely questions that your reader is going to have. Um, and I, I've given you the example that I like to think of somebody called Dubious Dave, but I, I'm trying to think of what a, an incredulous reader might ask, or what a skeptical reader might ask, or what the devil's advocate might ask. And I'm trying to, not directly, I'm not necessarily organizing around these questions, but I'm trying to include answers to those questions. Um, and uh, so that's just something that I want you to think about is, you know, anytime, I, and this is going to be an important thing to think about as we work on our next assignment, which I'll talk about it in just one minute. Um, that's an important thing to do whenever you're writing to the general public is what, what types of questions are they likely to have? And actually, if you can go down and, and sit down and write down those, those questions, that gives you a good basis and a good sense of where to begin. Uh, one of the things that I try to do in all of my classes is to give you techniques um, that help to eliminate the initial inertia of writing. I realize that sitting down and being asked to share 
um, a scientific finding or to make a persuasive scientific argument can be a pretty daunting task and to have that cursor flashing at you in Microsoft Word can really sort of um, augment those that stressfulness but I think if you start with reader questions that at least gives you a sense of what content you need to include so uh, those are just a few pieces of advice so we're gonna put that assignment to bed so to speak and uh, you guys you know do the best that you can with it everybody's you know you know, one of the things that I, I constantly have to remind students is that writing is a developmental process. And that means uh, it's developmental at a number of different sort of levels. On the one hand, it's a lifetime developmental process. You will continuously learn more about writing. I learn something new about writing virtually every day, and it mostly happens through reading your writing and thinking about how to uh, help you with your writing tasks. But it's also developmental on a smaller scale through individual assignments. And so all that I can ask that you do, and really the thing that I hold you the most accountable to in this class, is that I see development at each of those levels. That you're taking feedback seriously and trying to uh, remedy maybe some of the issues with an individual writing assignment, but also that you're trying to uh, incorporate those lessons into uh, future writing assignments. So that's all that I can ask. So our next assignment is very different, and it's something that I think I have to make sort of an argument to you about, and it's called a, it's called a fact sheet. And uh, fact sheets are becoming a very, very important genre of writing. And if you do a quick Google search um, and, you, and you search fact sheet or science fact sheet or health fact sheet or how to write a fact sheet, uh, you're going to find that they are a very important uh, type of, of document. And essentially what they are are very uh, readable, rapidly readable documents that get a reader up to speed on a particular topic. And so they can be written for any number of reasons. Um, and they live digitally, so they can live on websites where people can go and, and get this information and print it off or just read it quickly to educate themselves on a topic. Or they can be the type of thing that you might see um, in an office or in a, in a convention setting where people are handing you these things. Uh, they're kind of like a talking points memo, if you will, uh, but really what they do is they encapsulate some topic succinctly, usually in a visual way, so they're easy to read in that way. They're uh, formatted, highly formatted. Um, they're not big blocks of text, uh, and, and what they are meant to do is to simply educate people about a topic. Um, and that topic could be a treatment, it could be a diagnostic tool, it could be uh, trying again to get them to change a behavior or to do something. And so I'm going to ask that you write one of those. And I realize that this is really, I mean, I, if the blog assignment asks you to push a, a new set of buttons, this assignment will certainly ask you to do that because I'm asking you to not only use simple language and to write to a general audience, but to do so rapidly. And so we're going to have to learn some strategies for that. But this is a, this is a very practical assignment because um, you will often have to create these types of documents for meetings. So you may go into somebody and ask for a change in policy, a change in procedure. You may ask for funding. You may ask for additional personnel. And you have to quickly and compellingly um, articulate your argument or show the data that supports your argument. And so it's, it's useful in that way. Uh, this, this is certainly a, a relevant task for those of you who are in nursing or in a health field because these are the types of documents that we often give to our patients um, or our clients that educate them about a particular prescription, about a particular disease, about a particular uh, uh, diet that we're asking them to adhere to, whatever it is. Uh, but what we're trying to do is, is to make the most accessible, the most useful, um, and the most readable document that we can so that somebody can read this and understand this information uh, quickly. And so we're going to have to learn a variety of ways to do that. But one of the things that I think is really important for us to cover in this class, at least over the course of a week or so, are document design strategies. So this week you'll be learning about two of those. Um, and these are two things that I think about before I begin any writing task. And I don't care if that's if I'm preparing a report for the president of the college or if I'm preparing something for you um, as my audience. I'm always thinking about hats and crap. And uh, both of those are, are just frameworks uh, or heuristics for thinking about how we can uh, develop a page um, and that that page can be user friendly and that we're using the space of the page proportionate to the impact it's going to have on the reader and that we're developing a page that ultimately um, is intuitive. That's it, you know, in some ways what we're trying to create right now is an interface for people to access information. We interact with interfaces every day. Blackboard is an interface. All of the apps on your phone are an interface. Every website you go to is, is an interface. And it's the interface, literally it's between you and the information, and it's the way that you locate and access information. And so that's what we're going to create is a fact sheet that educates or persuades somebody about a particular topic. And I will let you choose whatever you want. In week eight we had a chance to look at some about depression and to think about the pros and cons of each approach. 
And I just want to, you know, uh, I want you to rest assured I'm not asking you to be a graphic designer. That's not what this is about. What this is about is asking you to be an architect of information and, and to create an architecture of information uh, that serves the needs of your audience in an intelligent and in, in intentional way. And so that's what we're up against. So uh, hats. As you'll come to learn, stands for headings, which are the things that can break up a text and work like signposts. Access, it's the ability for people to access various pieces of information. Typography, that's our careful use of different fonts and, and typefaces to create different meaning. And space, and that is our careful use of white space, not only to, uh, to invite the reader into the page so that it doesn't seem like a text wall, the too long, didn't read um, sort of mentality, uh, but that ultimately uh, that we're using that to create various types of alignment and connections between information and crap as you'll come to learn stands for contrast repetition alignment and proximity and these are just tools that we can use to think about how we're going to intentionally put stuff on the page um, and you can apply this to virtually any type of document I teach crap and hats in all of my classes because what it, it forces you to do is to really think about how a reader is going to engage with the text and, and to me that's really important and this is something that you can use uh, not only in these deeply visual documents like a brochure or a fact sheet or a website but also in traditional uh, text based documents uh, that are, are certainly have more text like reports um, and proposals and those types of things because they allow us to chunk up the text and to create a nice superstructure or roadmap to the text. So um, we're going to be working on that and so uh, to do that you're going to have to really think about the ways that hats and crap can come to live on your document uh, but ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to put the most important information in front of the reader as quickly as we can so that we can educate them. Uh, and part of that, and, and this is a case I've been making to you all semester, is that we have to engage them into the text. And so uh, we're going to have to think intentionally and strategically about how we use contrast. So what words do we, uh, do we use uh, contrastively? So what words are we going to give the most attention to? And what's the effect that's going to have on the reader? Um, what are the compartments we're going to plug information into? That's where proximity comes in. And so you're really going to have to think strategically. So what I would encourage you to do um, and invite you to do is to create what's called a wireframe. So anytime I'm creating a document that I know is going to have to be uh, formatted um, carefully for the reader's benefit, whether that's a resume, whether that's a brochure, whether that's a website, whether that's a flyer, um, I, I like to sketch it out. And I, when, I, when I say sketch it out, I mean literally with my hands and I try to think about how I want to put the information on the page, how much space I want to um, allocate to each topic or each little compartment, and then I'm trying to think about the various signposts I can put on the page. So I would encourage you to do that. But I think this is a very, very practical assignment, especially for any of you who are going to have to uh, take your work out into the public and to communicate uh, the nature of your work or the nature of, of, of an area of expertise that you have rapidly to a reader. Um, these are very important. And these are the things, and in fact, some of the resources that I will share with you um, come from hospitals and public health officials because um, the CDC, the National Institute of Health, uh, you know, state governing bodies are producing these fact sheets so that people know what they need to know about the flu vaccine or they, uh, that they are educated on uh, what they need to know um, in case of flooding um, in terms of, you know, waterborne illness and things like that. So there's, it's, it's a very practical assignment and I want you to treat it as such. Your goal is simply to put the um, appropriate amount of information in front of a reader for rapid comprehension and that's what we're up against. Thanks a lot.